Welcome back to America Newscape. I'm Joyce Rockwood. For many people, their job is just a job. But today's guest is the reason why I've been able to say, my passion is my profession. And that's because he paved the way for this philosophy by living it and breathing it, and doing so through a very special lens. For most of his 50 plus career, it was the lens of an eight by 10 Deerdorf camera but it's really been his own lens and mind's eye that allowed him to create such famous, unique, and captivating images. Today, it's my honor to present to you David M. Spindell, a world-renowned commercial still life photographer who's also photographed some of the greatest all-time athletes <laughs> and the greats, or as he calls them, precious people in the world of entertainment. Joe DiMaggio, Chuck Connors, John Lennon, Richie Havens, Sid Bernstein, Angie Dickinson, Bruce Dern, Sid Caesar, and Imogene Coca, including Jerry Stiller and Ann Mira, to name just a few. Just <laughs> we a all few. have a story <laughs> of how we got our start and how we got to where we are. And today we get to start at the beginning and hear how this self-made man got his start in the world of photography and has flipped the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words, because the name Spindel is synonymous with a thousand pictures. Hello and welcome, my dad and David M. Spindel. How are you? Hi, I'm Joyce Rockwood, my daughter. <laughs> well, we get back to know. So, uh, we're gonna start out at the very beginning. <laughs> the very and beginning? I think there was a well, Okay, if you want, I can tell you. I actually I got influenced by a, a neighbor. His name was Matthew Brady. Most people say, "Who's he?" Yes, oh, he was a Civil War photographer. See, I'm very old. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I yeah. would love for you to just start out in telling us how you got started in photography. Where did well, it all begin? Initially, for you? yeah. Well, initially, my parents bought me a Brownie Hawkeye when I was a little kid. And I started taking pictures of, you know, people in the neighborhood, you know, my neighbor's cat, I photographed car accidents, so all kinds of things. And when I was graduating from elementary school, my sixth grade school teacher gave me a present, which I still have. It's this book. And in the book, she wrote, good luck in the future as an artist and enjoy your, and enjoy your work. When I told my mother and showed her the book, my mother says, you can't even draw a straight line with a ruler. How are you going to be an, an artist? But somehow Wait, I turned what out. what is the name of that book? What's the name the of that name book? The name of the book is <laughs> How to Make Pottery and Ceramic Sculpture. Well, why do you think she chose that book for you? I don't know, but I never did ceramics or pottery. I, don't, I went on to <laughs> photography. As a matter of fact, if you want to laugh, this is my sixth grade school teacher and my, the class and I'm on the end there. What's her name, your sixth grade school teacher? That's Mrs. Fink. I'm the guy on the end with, with my finger. That's me here, the big tall guy. So but that's Mrs. Fink who gave me the book, right? She gave me the book, you know, and apparently she saw something that my parents didn't see. As a matter of fact, I'm writing a book about my career and I have, I have a whole page about Mrs. Fink and letters she wrote to me and the school, the, the book is here, pictures, all different things about, you know, like knowing her for over like, I guess 70 years I wrote to her and would send the samples of my work. When she passed away at the ripe old age of 102, her grandson called me and said they were going through her closet and it looked like a warehouse of David Spindell photographs. Because I would always, I would always send her new things I did and in my book, I have all the, you know, the letters that she wrote me. I, I copied them and, and scanned them and put them into my computer. So I have a, a record of, you know, what she thought of me, which was pretty good, actually. And then uh, the next step was, uh, I think my brother was going to Hofstra College, stuck, you know, and he was on the photo uh, squad or whatever you want to call it. So I found it interesting because I went in and I saw how he enlarged pictures and all. I said, gee, I should maybe get in larger someday. A couple of weeks later, my father, who was a local pharmacist for 50 years, one of his neighbors had a butcher shop 
and he knew I liked photography. So he came in, he says, you know, I have old federal lodge and trays and stuff, and I don't need that garbage anymore. Would you like it? I said, sure. Of course, I didn't bother to read a book how to use this stuff. I improvised. And I can still remember we were sitting down having dinner with my family and my brother says, well, when are you going to start, you know, using the equipment? I said, well, I'm enlarging a picture now. I'm exposing the negative. He says, what do you mean expose it? How, for how long? Oh, and I looked at my watch. It's about four minutes. He said, what are you doing? Cremating the thing? I didn't know you had to use a special <laughs> light bulb. I put a hundred watt light bulb in. When I looked at the negative, it looked like the landscape of the Gobi Desert. So that didn't work out too good. And then, let's see, what would you say? <laughs> um, so wait, you grew up You grew up in Brooklyn, New York, for those listening. Yeah. And, uh, and you, this is like, so after high school, you graduate high school and you have to make a decision, right? Are you going to college or not, right? So bring yeah. us to that point in your life. Well, what my mother did is she says, you know, you're going to have to do, you know, so I took careers. So I went to these careers. The one I remember the most that cracked me up is to become a rag ripper. I couldn't imagine what someone would do for the rest of their life ripping rags. So I said, Mom, I don't know what I want to do. Let's just cool it for now. I'll take a couple courses at Brooklyn College and decide, because, you know, most Jewish mothers want their son to be a doctor. That didn't work for me because if I see blood, I faint, you know. And I can remember I was taking a course in biology, and I had to dissect the pig, which almost killed me. But I cut out the heart, and I brought it home. My sister, I saw my sister who gets nervous with all this stuff. I said, honey, why don't you have a heart? And I showed her the pig's heart. She almost killed me. But that was just the crazy thing I did. But one of the wildest things growing up in Brooklyn, I lived across the street from what, of all things, was a Hopi Indian family, which no one it still doesn't believe that there were Hopis in Brooklyn. But there were, and uh, one of the things I remember, one day they were on the Johnny Carson show, one of his first shows, it was called Who Do You Trust? And this, I took a picture off the TV set, and that, that's the Indians with Johnny Carson way back when. And over, over the years, and, you know, I went off to college to study, you know, photography, and people say, well, why did you, what college did you pick? Well, my mother had a friend, her name was Ann Bell. I remember well because she was a big buxom woman. I was young and impressionable way back when. <laughs> it's like my grandmother. They said, "What do you remember about your grandmother?" I said, "I used to remember like to put my kepi on her boobies. That's put my head on her boobies." <laughs> Anyhow, so she said, "Well, I have a. I know someone who just graduated from RIT." And I said, "RIT isn't that a, a dye for clothes or something?" So he says, "No, it's a school for photography." because my father sold red dyes in his drugstore. So uh, I said, okay, I'll send out an application and see if I get out, you know, accepted. And I was shocked, I got accepted. And I, one of the pictures I sent in, you know, for my upgrade, I sent in like five photographs. I sent in a picture of Little Hunter. That, that's Little Hunter, when I knew him, where was he here? That's him way back when, and that's him 50 years later. And what's interesting wow, so I, yeah, let's hear the 50 years later story. We got to weave is that a in here. Story. I was talking with a neighbor and she, you know, she had asked me to donate something for a, an auction of uh, Kachina dolls. I said, you know, I'm from, Mar I'm not from Arizona, even though I was living here now. I said, I'm from Brooklyn. I don't know even what a Kachina doll was. So she said, well, I have a friend who has a whole collection. So we went over her house and I'm photographing him. And I'm telling the story about Little Hunter and Spinning Sun and Blue Coin, you know, all the Hopis that I, I knew back then. She says, well, I know a Hopi family that lives up on Second Mesa. Maybe we can go visit and find them. I said, I've tried for 50 years to find them. Had no luck. When we moved to Arizona, I called the Indian uh, organizations trying to track them down. They say they don't have names like Little Hunter or Spinning Sun. They have American names. I said, okay, what am I going to do? So we finally it took us like three months to get together and go visit this Hopi family. And we're talking and I'm telling him about my friend, Little Hunter. He says, well, I don't know anybody by that name. I said, well, you must have an American name, but I wouldn't know what it is. I said, just so happens I have a photograph of Little Hunter. So I showed it to him and he says to me, oh, I think that's my brother-in-law. And I'm going, oh, that's, 
baloney. You know, it's going to be his brother-in-law. There's 12,000 Hopis up on Second Mesa. This one Indian is going to be his brother-in-law. So I, he says, you want me to call him? Sure. So he calls his wife over, and him and his wife are talking Hopi. I said, you know, speak English. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You know, it's been 50 years. The only thing, I don't even remember how to say, go to the bathroom in Hopi, you know, which is important to know. So he gets on the phone, and he's talking in Hopi again. I said, why don't you just use your drum? I was trying to be a wise guy, you know. So it says, <laughs> uh, I have someone here that wants to speak to you. So he hands me the phone. I said, okay, I'll go along with the joke. I say, little hunter? He says, is that you, David? It was his brother-in-law. What are the odds of that? So we spoke for a little while. He, I said, how do you know it was me? He said, who can forget that stupid voice of yours? <laughs> and, you know, so we, you know, we ended up getting together the next day and spending quite a bit of time together. And now I've, I've seen him several times since I moved to Arizona. But these are just one that of the strange stories. That literally brings tears to my eyes. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's get back on track. That's incredible right. to have reconnected with him after like what sixty something 50 years. years. Fifty years. Crazy. So, so you know, Bell. After, so after Bell, you know, suggested I sent out an application. I was accept, accepted to go to RIT. I spent four great years there. I went there for an education, but somehow I came home with a wife, which I still haven't figured out. And someone says, "Well, how'd you meet your wife?" I said, well, actually, I wanted to kill my roommate because he, he was dating this nice Jewish girl. And he said, she's got an older sister. You want a double date? I said, a Jewish broad? She's going to end up wanting to marry me. I said, I don't want to go there. So finally, I broke down. I said, okay, we'll double date. Well, make a long story short, he married the sister, and I married my, the, the older girl, Barbara. <laughs> been my wife for 55 years. I joke with so people. So now your said, college roommate has been your brother-in-law. <laughs> Yeah, and I've hated him ever yeah. since. No, <laughs> I joke with people. I joke with people. If I had shot my wife when I got married, I'd be out of prison now. That's an okay. Old joke. Uh, and on that note, <laughs> can we go into what happened when you graduated college. You needed so to find a job. I go. go uh, a guy calls me after I graduate. He says, "I got your name from RIT. I'd like to interview to be my assistant." So I go in to see this guy. And he, he asked me if I had any uh, experience. I said, no, I just graduated. Uh, I didn't, wasn't involved in any work programs or anything, but I'm quite knowledgeable. I, I can go film, develop, and whatever. So he hired me. That job lasted about a year. And I just got bored with it because he did uh, catalog stuff and he did uh, fashions for uh, simplicity patterns. What's interesting, I have here, when he, uh, one of the models that he used came in and he said, this is the model we're going to use for the photo shoot. And I looked at her and I said, she looks like a bad lady to myself. She goes in the dressing room, 15 minutes later, she comes out and there's this gorgeous creature standing. I said, what happened to that other lady? I, I, I went and looked in the room to see if there was someone else in there. Turned out, she t turned out to be Wilhelmina. That one of the most famous models, she ended up opening up her own head edges. I mean, model edges. But just goes wow. to show you, show you what goes on. And when he would do these uh, photographs for some, a company called Simplicity Patterns, someone, this artist would come in and paint backgrounds. And the artist turned out to be the actor, well, Peter Usenhoff, a famous actor. This was his brother, who was an artist. And this is a postcard. I don't know if you can see it. In the background, he painted a scene of Paris, mm. yeah. which is kind of neat. The, the model, they say, what, what, what are they going to do standing there? So I gave him my Hasselblad. So that's my Hasselblad in the postcard. <laughs> oh. So, okay. So your first job lasted a year. And then what happened? A friend of mine from college, Andy Botwood, said, I just left this job working for a company called Three Lions. They're looking for someone. So I couldn't wait to leave working for this guy, Phil Rodell, because I was getting bored with it. I mean, to give you an idea, he went on vacation and said, nothing's going to happen for a week. You know, just watch the place. Well, a job came in. I shot the job for B. Altman. It was my wife came in. We shot the job. He built the client $5,000. He thanked me. He didn't even give me a bonus. I said, that was one of the reasons I decided it was time to leave. Yeah. Wow. But, you know, but it's interesting because if we talk about the next person you worked with, it was quite the opposite. 
right? Yeah. Well, I worked for this company. After Three uh, Lions? Three, three Lions. I worked with a fellow named George Pico, who was fabulous. And he happened to be married to Gene Ritchie, the folk singer. So we were always, you know, listening to folk music. I got to a point, I said, let me out of here. <laughs> but I learned a lot from him. I created, we created photographs, all different types of things. It was basically a stock photo agency. I actually ended up on a couple of detective covers as a murderer. Part of the job was being a model. <laughs> but, you know, it was fun. And, and, I would and then where did you go after that? Then I worked for a guy... Um, his name was Max Waldman. He did theatrical portraits and stuff. I could never be allowed in the space where he's taking the pictures, but he let me develop the film. I said, this guy's a wacko. I got to leave. You know, I mean, he was a nice guy, you know, but I can't watch what he's doing. I said, I'm supposed to learn. So then I left him and I went to someone, a guy named Bruce Elkis. Uh, he was, his address was 215 and a half East 22nd Street. I worked with him for maybe a year. You know, you know, I was getting jittery because he wasn't that busy all the time. And the stuff he did to me wasn't big time commercial advertising. And mm -hmm. one of his friends was a guy named Carl Perutz, who was a famous photographer. And he says, I know a guy's looking for someone, you know, to hire. I said, who? He says, well, his name is Tosh Matsumoto. I, well, I don't know who Tosh Matsumoto was. So I said, okay, you know, I'll go try out. So I called. I set up an appointment with the secretary. Her name was Noel. She says, well, come in, and I came in, and told you, I meet Tosh, and he gave me a layout. It was for um, s and green stamps. It was like the corner of a bathroom to hang up curtains and do all these knickknacks. So I go and do it, and I come out and, and say, it's ready. He comes in, he looks, he walks out, doesn't say a word. So I'm saying, <laughs> maybe he didn't like what I did, you know. Then he says, uh, oh, if you go behind the wall on the left side of the studio, you'll see I buy supplies in quantity. He doesn't buy two rolls of toilet tissue. He buys a case, which is appropriate for now. Everybody <laughs> panicking and buying toilet tissue. So I straightened it all out, you know, being very organized. And he comes back and he looks and shakes his head. Doesn't say too much. I go to the secretary. Well, what's with Tosh? You didn't say a word. She says, don't worry about it. He liked what you did. We'll give you a call in a day or two and let you know. I said, well, I'm not going to get this job. <laughs> I mean, with his personality and me, Mr. Bubbly, you know. She goes, he says, Tosh likes you, he wants you to start working for him. I said, oh, great. You know, the first day we're there, he's photographing a tub of butter for gray advertising. He oh, says to me, you want to know something funny? I said, I'm ready for a joke. He says, they're paying me $2,500 to photograph this tub of butter. That's when what I decided. What year was that? That was uh, 1969. I said, that's when I decided. I'm going to be a still life photographer. <laughs> the heck with fashion. Right? So I worked for him for like a week. And I, you know, and I put in a lot of overtime. I, I also made color prints for him because he bought one of his drums. You can process your, you know, make color prints for his exhibits. And at the end of the week, I got my paycheck. And I said, gee, he doesn't pay overtime. So I said to the secretary, doesn't Tosh pay overtime? You know, I mean, he offered me a lot of money to work for him anyway. I was going to ask for $100. He offered me 150 So I wasn't about to argue with him. So I took the 150 which was a lot more than I was making at Three Lions. Now, was so 150 said, a week or 150 a month? A week. What was that? A week. Okay. A week. Said, Wait, that's just the beginning. So I said to uh, Noel, I said, so he doesn't pay overtime. So she says, no, he does. But he waits till the end of the month. He adds up how many hours and then gives you a check. Okay, fine. The end of the month comes and he gives me the check and it's like a thousand dollars more than my paycheck. <laughs> I said to myself, I like working for this guy. I said, so I said to Noel, I said, did he make a mistake of the zero or something? She says, no, he looks at how much work he did. He likes you. You did it. And that's what you get. Thousand dollar bonus. I went for about a year and it got to a point that to me, you know, you're too good to work for me. I said, oh, I'm getting fired. You mean you're going to find me? He said, no, I'm going to give you two weeks to go find the space to open a studio. I said, two weeks, find a space. Yeah, I, I was a little nervous. I said, no, it wasn't on my list of things to do. I figured I'd just work for him until whenever. I never planned on that. I guess in the back of my mind, I thought maybe someday I'll open a studio. Because a lot of my classmates open up studios pretty quick. But for some reason, I just like working for people. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the salesmen, his name was Jack Matrani, a real nice guy, used to work for Arkin, a photo company, said, I know a guy who's selling a studio space. I said, okay. So I got, go down and meet this fellow, a real nice guy. His name was Jimmy Dimitropoulos. I'm still in contact with him. It's over 50 years. And uh, he says, uh, actually, I'm a cab driver. I was trying to do photography on the side. He did a lot of stuff at some of the uh, fancy nightclubs. He photographed uh, Robin Williams. You, you name, a, name a celebrity that was starting out around the 70s and in the late 60s, he photographed them. So I ended up buying the space from him and, you know, opened the studio. And what was funny, he calls me up one day. He says, I have a client in, in my cab the other day wants me to photograph a stereo system, and I don't know how to do a still life. So I said, would you do it, and I'll, I'll deliver it. So I did the job, and make a long story short, the art director ended up wanting to meet me because he found out Jimmy didn't take the pictures. I ended up working for this guy for 30 years. We became friends. His name was John Nordling, and I'm still in oh, contact yeah. with him. It's just unbelievable. Wow. So uh, I finally decided, you know, I tried to find a rep. You need somebody to go out and get your work. Well, it's not easy to find somebody. Most of the reps come in one twenty-five percent of your existing business and don't offer you anything. I said, that's a great job, you know, hire five, take on five photographers, get 25% of the business, and you don't have to do a damn thing. So I decided I'd rep myself. And my father being a pharmacist, I said, good idea, go to a pharmaceutical agency. So I went up to this one agency, it was called Shallow Rubin, and I met this art director, I remember his name now, Jim Horn, or no, yeah, Jim Horn. And he showed me a layout for a, a pharmaceutical thing called Percodan. It was a big, he shows me this big pill he has. And he says, I have like 14 eggs. Each pill will, the pill will be photographed with surgical equipment and whatnot. I said, sure, I can do it. Meanwhile, I'm saying, I don't know what he has in mind. Well, the end result, I do the job. He loved it. He so send me a purchase order. I never even got around to asking him how much. I just figured whatever it is, it's got to be more than I was earning as a sin assistant. The purchase order comes in the mail. It's for $6,000. I almost had a heart attack. So I call him up being a wise ass, as I usually am. I said, that is plus expenses. And he says, oh, of course. That was my first job that I got on my own. And from then on, I just threat myself. Occasionally I had people try out to be my rep, but it never really worked out. I just got tired of dealing with people who just, they said they're going to go see people and they end up not, you know, staying home watching TV and eating pizza. So, <laughs> so but, you have had quite the story, quite oh, the process. Unbelievable. Yeah, well, during, you know, my over 30 years having in my own studio, I got to meet so many famous celebrities. I mean, I never expected to meet half these people because I was a still life photographer. What got it started is uh, I had created a couple of uh, baseball posters, uh, an ad agency. I worked with an art director named Al Batista, a really talented artist. And I'm also still in contact with him for over 50 years. And uh, his agency had a job to do a couple of covers for Yankee Magazine. And they came in and they gave me like five uniforms and said, make a cover. I said, don't you have a layout? That's your job, you're the art director. So he says, well, you're so creative, come up with something. Well, what I did is I had just finished building a dark room in a, a new home that my wife and I bought in Congress, New York. So I tore the paneling off the walls, brought it in, and I built a set and did the cover. And then he gave me another cover to do. And the next thing you know, I start collecting baseball memorabilia. I'd go to these, uh, you know, baseball shows and buy all this what other people call junk, but I thought it was beautiful collectibles. In a way, I have to thank my mother-in-law, you know, my wife's mother, because when I was in Rochester, she used to go to garage sales. And being from Brooklyn, I said, what are you going to do, buy a garage? I didn't understand garage sales. But she bought all these little knickknacks all the time, and I fell in love with all the old little items. So I started collecting stuff. And with baseball, there was so much memorabilia around from the old days, because now everything is, you know, the, excuse me, the memorabilia they make is, you know, what they call, I call throwaway memorabilia. It doesn't last too long. Yeah. And I ended up working for Major League Baseball for 25 years. But I got to meet, so, I, I, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, finish, finish what you're gonna say. So I ended up uh, creating a post on Mickey Mantle 
and he loves it. And then uh, someone said, well, why don't you show it to so many other places? Maybe you can do something for them. Well, through, through a series of events, I ended up creating, oh, excuse me, I need a drink. It, this is, it's not the <laughs> booze, just plain water. My wife doesn't let me drink because I'm on some medicine for my foot that got infe infected. I can't even talk straight. Mm. You, don't, you don't drink anyway. <laughs> no, I don't I've never anything. seen you hold a beer in my life. <laughs> yeah. well, I ended up meeting Joe DiMaggio. And what was great about him is uh, I set up this still life. And I'm about to, you know, getting ready to work on it. He calls and says, can I come by and see it? I said, oh, my God, that wasn't part of the deal. I said, you know, I didn't expect him to come. So I got kind of nervous. So he comes to the studio. He said, I brought a few things for you might like to use in your still life. I said, well, I wonder what he has. He had a baseball signed by Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev. I freaked out. I said, how'd you get that? He says, well, I was invited to dinner at the White House. I said, what? they invited you to dinner? I said, you haven't done anything in 50 years. I was joking with him. So he told me not to be a wise guy. And he also had a humidor that the players gave him, gave him when he had his 56 game hidden streak. And it, when you opened up the, the humidor, it had the signatures of all the players in it, Incredible. which was terrific. <clears throat> and he was going off to Italy. So he left it with me for over a month. When he called up and wanted to pick it up, I said, what, what are you talking about? I don't have anything of yours. <laughs> <laughs> the baseball sold for a quarter. The baseball ended up selling for a quarter of a million dollars at an auction if he passed away. I know you have incredible stories to share about all of the incredible precious people that you have worked with, but we're going to save some of those stories for another time because I think that we should have you back to uncap the incredible treasure trove of other stories and memories that you oh, have. That you have every celebrity I photographed became a story. I mean, unbelievable. Yes. And also they became my friends for 30, 40 yes. years. Which and it's really clear to me that you have kept some really precious people of your own throughout your whole life and maintained some really beautiful friendships with the people that helped you get started in your career, yeah. right? Yeah. Unfortunately, so most of the guys I work for aren't around anymore, but the most of the celebrities, I just lost Jerry Stiller, who was, I knew for 37 years. I have letters yeah. and Christmas cards from him. I got stories next time. I'll tell you stories. Captain next Hepburn, Betty Davis. So, let's bring everyone back. Okay. Let's bring everyone back because you are someone who has been able to really create a career by following your passion. So what would you like to say? Do you have any other parting thoughts that you'd like to share with anyone listening who might be getting started out on their career and any words of motivation or inspiration? Well, whatever your passion is, follow, keep at it. Don't let anyone tell you, no, it can't be done or you don't want it. That's not a good job. Do what you want to do and get paid to do your hobby like I did. Because mm -hmm. too many people end up getting a job, working nine to five and get their paycheck and go home and get a six pack and watch TV. That's not a life. You have to enjoy what you do. And I'm, you know, when people say, are you retired? I say, no, I relocated from, you know, New York. I'm now living in Arizona. I'm still keeping busy. Well, Dad, you have been my inspiration for me following my passion of supporting others and helping them to live more dynamic and healthy, vibrant lives. So I want to thank you for leading me in a similar fashion. This has been oh. Joyce Rockwood with David M. Spindell talking about how to make your passion your profession. Additional links and information on David and how to get in touch with him can be found in our read more section right below this video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.